Hello, and welcome to this Atheist Republic discussion. I'm Susanna. We also have our co-founder, Armin, here. Hello. He's not gonna, there he goes. And we also have joining us today, Deborah. Hey. So Deborah has a really interesting story. She is an ex-Mennonite, and we're going to talk about that. She also converted to Islam and was um, married to a member of Hizb Tahrir and... Um, Hizb Tahrir. Thank you. <laughs> what was I just telling you? And um, was involved in a polygamous marriage and has since um, es escaped that relationship and has is now ready to share her story with the world. So, Deborah, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I wanted to start off with talking about your Mennonite upbringing because I feel like it is a group and a culture that people don't know a lot about because yeah. it is very insular, well, tends to be. Right. And um, if they do know about it, they tend to have a lot of misconceptions about it. So yeah. can um, for those who aren't, don't know what a Mennonite is, you might be familiar with the Amish. It's very similar to the Amish way of life. Yeah. Um, so, Deborah, could you describe a little bit about Mennonite, um, the way of life, and how you grew up? Okay, so um, my, so there's a lot of sects of Mennonites. So my family comes from, they're called Mexican Mennonites. They ultimately settled in Mexico. So my great-grandparents came from Russia and Prussia area. Then my grandparents uh, were born in Canada, so they all settled here. Then they all moved to Mexico, and that's where my, my parents were born. So there's like a large um, migration between Mexico and Canada um, all the time between these Mennonites. And so they settled, and they, they stay pretty um, separate as well like they have little villages and they don't have electricity and such and that's how my parents were raised and they all came back to Canada as adults and um, they didn't raise us that way they kind of moved to the city and got jobs and we got to go to school and such so yeah that's really interesting so you went to school in more of an immersive community yeah, so I got, no, yeah, so I was in, an, like, a regular public school here in Canada, so I was, like, the first generation to do that, and the first generation to, like, go to high school and graduate, like, and get a diploma, so that's, like, a, we were kind of, like, first generation immigrants, kind of. Here, mm. so. so, what do they believe in? Like, what's, the, what's the, that religion like? It's, uh, so it's, like, old order Mennonite, or old colony Mennonite, you'd call them. And um, they believe that you need to stay separate and um, stay away from the worldly people and worldly things. And they kind of like have these weird rules like, you know, music and uh, they segregate people and there's no, like men and women as well are segregated. And um, no divorce, you know, no birth control. So it's like, it's like most Mennonite sects kind of like that. But it's generally Christian, right? Oh, it, sorry, it is a Christian. It's Protestant. Uh, it came from Menno Simons is a guy that kind of branched off of the Protestant movement movement way back and uh, started these uh, this like separatist uh, pacifist movement. So they didn't participate in any wars. That was how they kind of like stayed away, and that's why they ended up migrating all over so that to avoid drafts and things like that. It's really interesting. Many, yeah, it's funny. I went from pacifist to like totally the opposite. Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, so you, how many? Like, you can have also multiple wives. Can or should? Sorry, no, uh, not Mennonites don't do that. Oh. No. That's Mormon. They kind Mormon. of added that in there. Okay. Okay. And um. I'm curious, so there's this kind of stereotype of Mennonites as looking like they came out of, like, the 1800s, yeah. like, very strict. Um, I know some are even yeah. kind of, like, 
ultra orthodox and that you know it's already decided what kind of colors you can wear or yeah. they'll speak um various kind of very hyper localized versions of german um yeah. So was that what your parents came out of more? Because yeah. it doesn't sound like you were on that right. I I was immersed in it a lot. We used to go visit. Uh, we would drive to Mexico and spend summers there in that. Um, but my parents kind of got out of that and wanted to raise us like Western kids kind of thing. Um, and they do speak a different dialect of German. It's called Low German. And mm. so we grew up speaking that too. They didn't even learn Spanish in Mexico because, you know, that's like the evil people. Like, you just stay away. Oh, what the hell? Oh, and very much like you marry within your families. Like, not cousins, but like anywhere past that. So, like, you're just, everybody's just intermarrying and keeping everybody pure. There was is a it? show called Pure that came out about the Mexican Mennonites. It was a CBC show. Sorry. Interesting. No, no. And and they wear that thing that looks like a hijab as well, right? Is that it's, the many? Uh, so yeah, that's there's different sects again. So the old order wear like a little, they call it like a kerchief. So it's just like a little square thing on top. That's all. Just after you're married, though, <clears throat> to signify mm. the marriage. Mm, yeah, it looks like a little bonnet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in the environment that you grew up in. It sounds like there was a mix of coming into the modern world, so to speak, and more integrated community, but still an adherence to some of these really old stringent standards. So what kind of um, behavioral controls were over your life? Was there a lot of gender segregation still? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so girls and boys, I mean, have different roles. So I don't know. There's just always uh, in, an inequality. There, the children and women were always treated so so bad. I mean, th- there's a lot of abuse amongst the Mennonite community. Like it's just stuff that's thrown under the rug constantly. Just like the Catholic Church, like stuff. There's so much like child uh, molestation and sexual abuse. Like rampant between these communities and so I grew up just kind of seeing all this like the negative parts and then you go to church and everyone's all like holy and stuff so I saw so much hypocrisy hypocrisy all the time growing up so um I don't know I, I couldn't place where the inequality came I mean you're reading the bible and you're told you know Eve you know basically destroyed things for women (laughs) so we're meant to suffer my mom like repeated growing up saying women are just meant to suffer that's it so that's basically a Mennonite woman's life in a nutshell and what is the structure of religious faith there so um in kind of these new Protestant movements you know at least kind of my reference is Mormonism, you know, they have the structures of like the elders or the Jehovah's Witnesses also have elders and then the governing yeah. body. So what is, um, yeah, what is the church structured like in Mennonite culture? Yeah, they have like uh, the, the preacher is the head and then they have like bishops and then it's all run by men and um, they appoint preachers like they appoint you I always thought that was so weird they would like just pick someone against even if they didn't want to and they had to do it like it's just strange I was always scared I'm like what if they pick my dad he can't even read <laughs> like what but they do this still it's funny they still do this but they would never let me in that church right now they it's very like you get like you have to be a member and you have to adhere to like the way they live so and do they practice, because um, I know that the Amish practice um, r- um yeah. which is like your, if you grew up in the ultra-conservative community, your chance to experience being of the world, so to speak, for I think about a year. And then at that point, you either decide you leave permanently or you come back in. Yeah, and that's more is that evolved. something that they practice? No, they didn't oh. allow any of that. You would just get excommunicated. That's it. Mm-hmm. So they do yeah. practice shunning? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
It's really interesting. So, and what does your family think about you right now, then? Um, <laughs> they just blame, you know, my my experience with my past marriage that it ruined me for religion. They're, obviously, they're not happy that I don't believe in anything. I mean, I get calls, you know, saying that, you know, Jesus is coming soon and I need to, you know, prepare. You know, it's just... <laughs> But they, oh, I'm gonna but have they haven't to. given up on you? Like, they still try to reach to you? And yeah, you definitely. They they still... But are they nice I mean, to you? Like, like, do yeah. they... Okay. So they haven't, like, um, you know, thrown you out and, like, disowned you no. or anything? Like that. No, no. They're, they've always accepted me. I've been so fortunate that uh-huh. they didn't reject me ever. Like, okay, even, great. Yeah. Good, good. Okay. So, sorry, Susanna, go ahead. Oh, no, that's fine. Um... And what I find interesting is that you actually did have a shot at education because I know um, in these very traditional Mennonite groups, there isn't really a high value placed on um, education. And I know that some only teach out of the Bible, and that's basically like your only textbook. And so what was it like to have access to more of an education, but come from a general community where that's not seen as something like the most yeah. valuable? Yeah, it's it was interesting because my dad saw the value in the education. Uh, I mean, I think he had to quit school at grade six. The boys are taken out at grade six and the girls are taken out earlier. I think they just basically teach them as long as you can read the bible you're good like and you can memorize some stuff and you know how to cook and clean but um sorry uh can you repeat (laughs) just like what it's like to be able to attain a higher level of education so my dad yeah that's what i was doing he um he saw the value in education, and he would encourage me a lot. And so I took that to heart, and I, I worked hard. And I did um, appreciate, because I saw how my parents struggled. They couldn't read, and they had to teach themselves English when they moved uh, to Canada at age 20. So I taught them a lot of spelling and things like that. So I did see the value in it, and I appreciated it a lot. Again, and then <clears throat> you resent the Mennonites for that, too, because they're preventing all this uh, from all the people and all the children. Um, is, sorry, is your father still around? Yeah. Okay, does he regret now teaching, giving you education, given the Oh, practice? no. Okay. No, he's still happy about that. So do, do they? Do you think that your education had anything to do with the fact that you left at some point? Um, yeah, I definitely. I brought. I went to Bible college, and I remember taking Old Testament course, and it was like this pit. I felt everything fall. It was like because you just believe this is a divine thing, and then you're like, okay, so they got all these manuscripts, and they explained where they got everything from, <laughs> and then who sat there, and so for a while it was just these ones, and it's like, what? This is not like it. Just I was everything started falling apart really at that mm. point because when you have no education, you're preacher or whoever can tell you all these magical things and you'll just believe it for the rest of your life so um that's when you just start looking at a lot more things skeptically i guess i and, wonder if um, any i wonder if anybody would use your case as an example of why uh, education is dangerous so like look she got <laughs> i spoke to some christians and they're like so what happened this is when i was a muslim and they would be like so i want to know what happened and i explained that like the bible yeah. college thing they were like see christians just get too much education and i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> Dang. That's the worst thing i ever heard like, oh my goodness it's... this is a little old oh. oh no you're back you're good you're here I think Susanna. Okay, I'm going to keep talking even though you're frozen for me. Okay, Um, and this is a little bit tangential, but I'm curious. Like, what is Bible college? Oh, right. What is that? (laughs) 
Oh, so I grew up in a conservative rural area of Canada, and it's uh, it was all Mennonites where I went to school, and so there's quite a few Bible colleges <laughs> around. It's where you, they have regular, you know, I was taking a psychology program, so you can transfer those credits to university after, but now you're getting all the religious courses, so you can go on to either work in a church or missionary, you know, that kind of stuff, and um yeah, by the way, the most uh, disturbing boyfriend I ever had was from Bible college. <laughs> Just for, like, the messed up mentality of people. I can imagine. Um, and so are these colleges accredited? But they just happen yeah. to have a heavy emphasis on um, religion? Yeah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so wait, so, uh, the co- like, they are trying to teach you... So the 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 course you t- took was like a it wasn't a secular way of looking at uh, the Bible like it was actually trying to. It was uh, a real. I mean, I thought it was uh, because we had all versions of Christians. I think it was just a Christian Bible college. Like, but every sect of Christian was there. So that was interesting because mm-hmm. you know how some sects of Christians really think each other are so wrong. <laughs> Same right. with Muslims too, right? So the course wasn't even trying to be, give, like, wasn't even trying to give you a non-religious view right. of what the Bible, but even we though it was... We had wasn't... all of the problems laid out. They're like, okay, so here's all the contradictions, and, and they, they here's a uh-huh. book, and here they list, cause, because you, we're going to have to refute this stuff if you're going to uh-huh. go on, right? Okay. So they're like, okay, so here's all the things. And it's like, oh. And they're like, so what you got to do is, you know, you have all these problems and you stand back like a painting and you're going to look at it as like a moral right. thing instead of like little problems. So that was kind of the gist of that. So that even problem. though the course was not trying, it was trying to like help you defend the Bible, it did the opposite for you. Totally. I don't right. know. I wonder if I'm not the only one. I don't know. Oh my gosh. I can only imagine, like, if this is supposed to be, like, apologist boot camp, Mm. like, how many people saw all that and was were turned away, like... Yeah, because when you go into it, like, with, you only go to Bible college, you're, like, really full of faith, and you're just like, Mm. I want to, oh, I'm going to go to school for it now, and so you're really at your highest (laughs) spiritually with that, so it was, like, a real, like wake-up call, like, whoa, this is just human beings here, <laughs> honestly. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting because in Iran, I remember having this, being part of this educational, not part of the school system, but private education uh, classes that was preparing us for the university interest, interest exam. And we were going through um, one of the chapters um, of, you know, our religious studies, that was teaching us about, you know, the chapter of that book was about women in Islam. And it was trying to refute the idea that women are inferior in Islam. And to do that, it was going through the verse, some verses of, about women in Islam, right? Some, and I remember, and, and the reason why I say this is not part of the school system is because there were girls in my class at that, uh, you know, if this was part of the education system, we wouldn't have any girls in the class, right? But this was yeah. private. Uh, separate, right? Uh, and I remember just the teacher going through these um, explanations and one of the girls just in the middle of the class just started crying. Just just, just started like tears and everything and the teacher went to her and she, she was like, it's okay, it's okay, I understand. This happens a lot. And I, at that time I didn't understand why she's crying. The, the course is telling you why women are the same. But she was like, but what I didn't understand is because we were going through the all the things that actually made her not the same to t- to counter that, and she was being <laughs> exposed. Exactly. she was being exposed to all the things that were telling her that she's not the same, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> Poor girls. Oh yeah. my god. All right, sorry, Susanna, go on. Oh, Susanna's internet connection today is is not that good, eh? Susanna, you're frozen now. All right, so let's continue. Oh, are you back, Susanna? I'm I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Go on. Next. Next question. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, sorry. I thought you were in the middle of a question. No. Um, so 
when you were going through Bible college and you really started to question your faith, um, I'm curious what that was like for you. Was it something that you gave up entirely or was it something like this isn't the right God or this isn't the right expression of God, but I still think of maybe like a general extrapolated higher power or I'm more spiritual? Um, I didn't like instantly leave uh, everything. I mean, I still continued church a little bit and things, but it was just more opening my mind to other possibilities more, I guess. Um, and then I um, I got married to a guy I was dating. He was atheist, so, I mean, his ideas made way more sense <laughs> to me. However, I didn't fully... Sh- shed the idea of God. I mean, when you grow up with it, that's a really hard thing. I I struggled a lot with that, but I really just kind of tried to stay spiritual, you know, just somewhat. Mm -hmm. Was it, were you afraid of losing your faith? I think, yeah, maybe it is. I mean, it's really ingrained in you that there's something, and the whole idea, I don't know what it is, looking at life as, like, everything is has been God's will or is God's will so when like somebody comes to you and you feel like this was meant to be now you have to deal with it accordingly so I feel like that shapes like so many actions I so I that is something I'm still like learning to shed even totally and so um I know you had this marriage with an atheist and then uh, you said it was basically like a practice marriage, and that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, it just didn't work. I guess it was like fine. I we just like, just didn't work. <laughs> yeah, and so it was after, um, that marriage that you met this other guy. So can you explain um about how you met your next husband? We actually met on a dating app. <laughs> I didn't mention that last time. But, yeah, that's how we met initially. And then he introduced me to all the work he was doing and where I was working, living, I mean, and um, uh, that he was Muslim. And I didn't know anything about that. So, and But he's very vocal about, like, you know, Muslims are just going to take over the world and you're going to have to learn Arabic one day. <laughs> like, he literally started saying stuff like that. And I was just like, whoa. I, li- I think I was reading The Handmaid's Tale at the time, even. It was like, this is like like a book right here. Um, but, again, that sparked my interest, like, heavily. So I started really, like, looking into... And then there's all those Islamic beautiful... Uh, peaceful Islam websites that promote all the miracles and um, how science is in the Quran. Look at all the proof, scientific proofs of the Quran. That all of those things surpass the Christian proof so far, like exponentially. Like it was just music to my ears. I was like, this is all the kind of crap I wanted the Bible to have, you know, just way more things, you know, and that they promote people to learn. And look, all these Muslims are supposed to go to school as far as they can. So it was the opposite of my upbringing. So to me, again, that was just like, okay. And it's like, because you're kind of just like taking the Bible and just transferring it and adding the Prophet Muhammad and the rest, it was like, kind of, you look at life being, okay, well, this is my fate now. Like, I kind of saw it as Again, this was brought to me and for a reason, and I had to act accordingly. It's very interesting because, well, the the version of Christianity that you were exposed to was the kind that said, like, oh, don't, right, uh, don't go get educated. But there are a lot of other branches of Christianity that is like the opposite, right? Right. Um, and. And also, like, we have that, and also the things that you wanted in uh, Christianity that that, as Mus- that, that ver- Muslims seem to be offering, um, there's also branches of Christianity that goes into all these miracles and all these, like, 
numerology and other miracles from the Bible as right. well. So they do have that. And there is also a lot of Muslims right. that do tell you not to go. I mean, that's the that's Taliban's, um, you know, uh, main thing. You know, thing don't go get educated. There's a lot of other branches of yeah. Islam that also tells you not to go get educated, and women especially shouldn't get educated. So there's that as well. Well, yeah. I was taught that that was like the wrong Islam. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Right. Sorry, Susanna. Maybe oh, I should. Absolutely. Okay, go. Ahead. Um, and I think what one thing that really attracted you to your future husband was that he was highly educated and he was yeah. very intelligent and articulate. And yeah. um, you, I think, went to one of his lectures initially. Yeah, and, and he was doing debates and, like, things, that's, like, exciting. And he was, like, winning them and, you know, he's just very good. He's a great speaker and people just kind of are drawn to him. So, of course, I was drawn to him as well. Your husband, he was highly educated, very charismatic. And so how did he introduce you to the idea of Islam? Um, well, he was basically telling me that it's the, the truth and it's going to take over the world. So let's, you know, you may as well <laughs> submit to it basically, right? Basically what he was saying. Um, I found that uh, not, I found it scary, but I found it exciting, too. I was like, whoa, it's, you know, and plus there's so many Muslims, so I'm like, it can't be, you know, that crazy either. That many people do it, right? <laughs> like, So, honestly, it just, it was like this, almost like a fluid transition from my previous experience. I don't know. Even the dress was similar. It was kind of like I was going back to my roots, it felt like. Yeah, that's what, what I find. Oh. oh, sorry. Armin, go ahead. So, but what convinced you that it's valid in any way other than, like, other than, like, was there just the emotional appeal um, of, oh, this seems familiar, oh, this guy seems so awesome, and he's like... Um, <laughs> he convinced me that the Quran was a miracle and that it has never changed and that it can't be changed because there's that challenge right to prove if one person writes something like it it'll disprove the entire religion right somehow i was fully convinced of that so i was you should listen to the episode that we had with abdullah gandal on how uh on secular jihadists and how often the quran has been changed oh i want to see this stuff because and i want to see any attempts to write something like it because i'm sure people have done that because i was never shown actually. anything because i was like it can't it'll never happen what's <laughs> really funny is that recently um an algerian atheist created the surah corona <laughs> and it is a surah written about the coronavirus no and um yeah, the person's name is Jilu, and it's really funny, and when you listen to it recited in Arabic, um, ex-Muslims of North America did recitations of it in uh, Urdu, Arabic, and something else, and it's really good. It sounds oh, awesome. really legit. Um, of course, the English translation doesn't do it justice, but it sounds exactly like the um, Quran. Yeah, and, so clearly people are constantly doing this, right? Yeah. And, so how um, is that a proof then? Well, exactly. I, I was convinced, so there, I guess. Yeah, Muslim. a woman in Tunisia Jeez. is actually facing six months in prison for just sharing this surah. Um, yeah. Because so the fact that people can replicate it so easily really seems to have pissed off a lot of people. Right. Uh, so Quran challenge fail. Um, <laughs> then that's it. It's over, right? Mm -hmm. Why is yeah. nobody acknowledging this? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. yeah. That's a big problem with, like, absolutist and totalistic ideologies, is if you can yeah. find one thing that disproves it, then everything else falls apart. But you have yeah. to be willing to look for those things, right? Mm -hmm. And um, maybe not be um, threatened if you do look for those things. Um so I'm curious about what um, entering your relationship was like. Um, I don't think you really dated in the way that most 
people date nowadays, no, right? There's no dating allowed. He made yeah. that clear. So you just you can talk about marriage only. And so after I converted, he convinced well no, I guess we talked about I'll just like marry him and I didn't really set a timeline. I just kind of drove out there one day and he arranged some a marriage like last minute called a bunch of people everyone was shocked <laughs> just didn't know what was going on who's this girl it's like a new convert so they all kind of took me under their wing like this group of people and um i was taught like the his but to rears ver- a version of islam it's just really uh i guess it would be the islamist version of islam the fundamental version of islam but um, it was very intellectual. We called it the intellectual Islam, basically. Was was it what was it that was appealing about him? Was he like at least handsome, or was he the yeah like what, tall, oh, yeah. dark, handsome? You know, from the east. I mean, it was the opposite of Mennonite. I refused to marry a Mennonite. That was absolutely not in my <laughs> thing. So yeah, it was everything like the everything, the exoticness of it. And he was also Canadian too, so he was familiar. So it wasn't some foreign person that had no familiarity with my culture or didn't know my language so it was he knew arabic spoke arabic but he spoke just as well english as i did so but it seems like you're also you're also were um the fact that he was in seemed very intelligent about what he was talking about and very confident about it yeah that also seems very appealing to definitely you know, like, all right sorry susanna um so you converted before you got married because it's my yeah. understanding that that's not technically a prerequisite to no. marriage. No, and he man. told me that too, that I didn't have to. I went and researched it myself and then I said the Shahada by myself on the computer screen and then I called him and I told him that I did it. I didn't even know how to say Shahada. I was like, the Shahada. So he taught me all the rest after that. And he was excited. He was like, okay, let's, you know, let's do this seriously. So he, initially we were going to get married as me not being a Muslim. I'm sure he was going to make me do it anyways. But yeah, I was like right in it. So to clarify to people, uh, the Shahadat is like the, you know, Declaration. Yeah, that there is one God and Muhammad is his prophet. Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet. That's, you have to say that to become a Muslim. Um, and also, with regards to why he is, a, he is able to marry you, uh, Muslim men are, are allowed to marry non-Muslim women as long as they're Ahlul Kitab, so like either Christian or Jew. Yeah. Um, but Muslim women are not allowed to marry anybody other than Muslim men. But right. for him to marry you, if you, even if you didn't convert, you had to be a Christian, though. So Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I hadn't, I guess... Maybe I just technically was baptized a Christian, so I used right. that. And I hadn't really left every anything fully. Mm. I just was kind of open-minded more. Yeah. I, You know, you can justify it if you yeah. want. I'm still culturally Christian, okay? Yeah, exactly. I was born a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> born a Muslim, right? And um, what was it like when you first converted but before you got married what one what was that timeline like and two how seriously did you jump into it in that period before your marriage oh it was so quick it was stupid um I drove up there one weekend and I just stayed I had been living with my brother at the time and I just called him I said I'm staying I didn't tell anybody that I got married or converted yet because I was you know I knew they would freak out um and then it was about a week or two that we drove out together to tell my parents and drop the bomb on them so that was scary and uh stressful and then my brother tried to rally a bunch of people together to attack him because they saw this 
evil Muslim man stealing his sister. Yeah, they were like, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I was like all freaked out. But yeah, they oh were God. Yeah, Mennonites. they were like, this is insane. Yeah. Mennonites going against Hezbollah Tahrir. I'm putting my money on Hezbollah Tahrir. <laughs> well, <laughs> but yeah, they, they, they wanted, they didn't know what to do. There was, this is insane. Nobody knows, knew what Islam was. Like, mm-hmm. And so, then what was your wedding like? Because clearly your family wasn't with you. No, it was just, we were just at somebody's house and then you have, we just got like the requirements. So you need like two witnesses and, or whatever. And then I needed um, somebody to give me away. So he just picked one of his friends <laughs> and it had to be a guy, of course, to a point because nobody was involved in my family. And um, I had one of the guy's wives with me, and she was, like, kind of talking to me. And um, uh, somebody brought me a bunch of hijabs and abayas, uh, which is, like, the full dress to put on. And I, and then we just, like, I don't even remember, like, what we said. You just kind of, like, agree. Like, the wife says nothing. You just kind of say, you don't even say anything. You tell the the mahram to tell him okay like you don't even talk i don't think yeah that's how it went and, and that was it you? and then we just left after that. were you happy were they like also treating you like it seemed was it a pleasant experience like it was were... uh it was they, everyone was nice but everyone was confused because they all knew him and they didn't know about me and there's mm. just some strange woman like showing up and so some people are like quite questioning, like, who is this? Like, what's going on? Um, people it... have tried to infiltrate that group. So like people were like warning him, like maybe she's trying to do that or, you know, that kind of thing. Isn't, isn't it, um, and isn't it the stereotype for, and I don't know how accurate this is, but it seems like a lot of Muslims, uh, this is their dream come true to have a white blonde Muslim co- convert as their bride. It I didn't know like... that at the time. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Right. <laughs> when all, I went to the mosque for the first time and I had all these old women coming up to me and asking me if I was married because <laughs> they wanted me to marry their son. <laughs> 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 but I was, yeah. I didn't know. My friend was telling me because I would be like, yes, I'm married and try to talk to them. Yeah. And then they'd get mad and walk away. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, yeah this, is a, this is like the ultimate prize. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Susanna. <laughs> oh, don't apologize. Um, and so you got married, and then it was game on. Yeah. So like what right was that big shift in your life like? Can you describe yeah. it for our audience? Because um, it sounds like it was just like night and day. Yeah, it was. It was. I it described it as my whole world went upside down. Like, because I changed my name, I changed my identity. I was dressing different, praying five times a day, trying to learn Arabic, trying to read Arabic. Um, you're so involved, and then I was so scared that I would never get to learn this stuff because it was so hard, and I. It was just weird to me that, you know, it's like a religion for all of mankind but you have to learn this one language for it but um so i was very overwhelmed but i mean and then we were doing so much activities with the hizab so going to a lot of universities and doing a lot of um activities with groups of people uh so i'm meeting a lot of sisters and um again they're all excited because i'm new so the newer you are the more exciting everything is um, I got pregnant, like, instantly, so I was, like, right away dealing with that aspect of everything, too, so it was just, I went from, like, working, like, full-time <laughs> all the time to this, it was just so different, so it was just, I guess, yeah, like I was explaining to Susanna earlier that it's such a cultish, uh, mentality where you're doing these things all day long and it puts you into this trance almost 
and you just can't think about anything else anymore. You're just, you can't think outside of it. It's just, you can't be objective anymore. And then the whole, like, ideology of why everything's happening around us at the same time. We weren't just learning the religion. We're learning about every aspect of the news at the moment and why. And it's all based around the West preventing the Hilafa from getting back together. That's been the campaign since World War I. And it's been every, like, motivation behind everything. So you're now reading into everything that way. And you're reading into it the way people treat you. So even if people aren't being mean to you, you're being told that people are against you now. And you are starting to feel an animosity that's not even there half the time. So it really separates you from, like, people around you. Yeah, it's an all-encompassing religion. It's not about, oh, here's your religion, do these things, and then go live your life and do other things. They're like, no, everything, you have to look at everything through a religious lens. Every aspect. I, I thought that was a good thing initially. I was like, there was, like, nothing left for you to interpret anymore. So, I mean, what you say when you enter a bathroom, what you say when you exit a bathroom, what you say when you enter a house, what you do when you... Everything, like, ev- like every breath you take and every time of the day <laughs> did any did you have did you notice any doubts or questions coming in your mind while this happening or did you completely shut the doors uh i think i completely shut the door when i learned about the apostasy thing i really shut that door hard it was uh i don't know how long it was not too long when i learned about that i'm like well that's it then <laughs> that's this is the final one. Like, it was just, I sh- like, that was shot, shut hard. <laughs> and what that. did you change your name to, by the way? Munira. Munira. Do you yeah. pick it yourself? Yeah, I just looked at a big list of women's Arabic names. <laughs> you know, everything looks foreign to you initially, so that one kind of sounded nice, and it wasn't hard to say or spell. or. What does it mean? means uh, lighting up a path or illuminating a path or something like that. Interesting. Yeah. And so because of your then husband's lectures and how you met him, and obviously this is something he was very passionate about, you knew that he was a hizb and you knew that this was the group oh, yeah. that he was a part of. Yep. But Outside of the information that he was telling you, how much did you know about this group? And did you seek out information about this group? Or did you just trust what he was saying? I had never heard of it before I met him. Um, and he explained it to me clearly. There, there's no hiding of what they are. It's a political group. And Islam is an ideology, not a religion. So they're using it that way. And so, um, and all of the what are outside criticisms, which we witnessed constantly, and they liked the debating and the backlash because it exposed other people's faults, you know. So I got to see every view from every type of Muslim of how, how people hated the hizab or, you know, disregarded them or, they, I mean, like most places ban them, like they don't like them working out of their mosques or schools because, I mean, they try to take over and everything, so. And how did they indoctrinate you into the hizab ideology? Because clearly it is a very specific ideology. It's pan-Islamist. It's fundamentalist. Like you said, it's politically focused and current events focused, geopolitically mm-hmm. focused. And um, yeah, so how did they start to really get you into that way of thinking? That was my only... Uh introduction to Islam anyway so to me it was like well that's just what it is and everyone else is wrong it's not a religion it's a it's like an ideology like any other right so the fact that it like had an empire at one point and it had a strict set of laws just like any other ideology so um, I just accepted it fully that that was the right one and I didn't question I like I was I felt fortunate that I had the right view and I I was always the type that was into uh current political events and the fact that this ideology jives with everything that's happening in the world is 
it just made more sense to me. I don't understand the not religion part. Doesn't the Quran refer to the Islam, to Islam itself as a religion? I mean, like on I, I don't know. Good question. Um, it, it I guess does. after the Prophet uh, established the Islamic State, maybe it turned into an ideology then. I mean, I an ideology, know. religion is an ideology. I mean, lakum dina kum valiya din, a din, din is translated as religion. So, Islam itself... But it's itself supposed is, to, um, but it's the problem, the West introduced secularism, which destroys what religion is supposed to be, right? Because it's, even, like, Christianity was supposed to, like, dictate your whole life, too. But because the West, we don't let you... Uh, implement every part of a religion anymore. You have to have the democratic version of um, society, yeah. I guess. Maybe they meant not just a religion. I don't know. Anyway, Susanna, yeah. sorry. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. You don't have to apologize. You can keep asking questions. I know. And, I know. You, have, I know uh, you have a big list. That's why I... Yeah, no, it. it's okay. <laughs> and so... That's really interesting. I said, like, this was this was the only Islam you knew. Like, this yeah. is just... Yep. Okay. And, um, so, you... They are involved with a lot of classes outside of just, like, regular, like, programming at the mosque, right? Like, I think you mentioned that you have to go to kind of a lot of, like, night classes, usually in someone's home. Can you describe that a yeah. little bit? So... Excuse me, they're like um, study groups and you study their books and they have a whole set of books that you have to go through. And I think you go one time a week uh, for two hours at a time and they have groups of like, it's like a small group. So they have one head up a group of like five people and um, and then they'll have like monthly meetings of, of everyone and they, I guess, address what they want to do and plan. But I mean, when you start taking these study groups, you instantly have to start also teaching other Muslims. So that's a requirement. So there's so many requirements on you. Otherwise, like you, they kick you out of the group. So it's like a real strict. And if you're late for meetings, they don't let you in. Like it's a very like militant style. <laughs> yeah. That's almost kind of like a little bit of like a multi-level marketing, like pyramid scheme structure. Well, where... so how do you spread ideas in the most effective way, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. Is there um, any sort of way that people are actively rewarded in the group for recruiting? Even maybe it could be as simple as just they're um, very rewarded socially for recruiting. Um, is there that kind of an attitude? Um, I guess... Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But you, as you become a member, you, your responsibilities grow, right? So you're just, it, it's like Islam, like you're, you're stuck in it once you're in it. Like, this is, you got to do the work now a until the Khilafah is here. <laughs> like, it's imperative. So they're always pushing the narrative that all Muslims are sinning. Uh, because we can't practice a lot of the Quran because the Sharia law is not able to be implemented. And therefore, if we're not trying to work towards it, then we're even more sinful for it. So it's that's the main propagation of it. And I'm under the impression that you basically had to actively memorize and regurgitate the information that you're given word for word, which I thought was a really interesting indoctrination technique. Um, can you talk about that more? Yeah, so everything's worded in a very specific manner. Um, I don't understand why, but um, I was asked to repeat back at least so many times the first paragraph of the first book that explains what revival is and how how to change your concepts so you can accept new ideas and it's like it's all about like how to brainwash people like the whole thing is about how to brainwash there's one whole book called thought and how to think like it's that in depth like mm -hmm. there's one called the islamic personality and how to like have the perfect islamic like disposition in every aspect of your life so you're going through like really like psychological stuff constantly and if you ever see any hisbis speak 
they all speak exactly the same. Like, you will spot them, and I could pick them out. Like, they just, you learn how to speak, and that's just how you speak. Yeah, it's really interesting. Have you ever heard of or read a book called um, Combating Cult Mind Control by Stephen Hassan? No. I think you <clears throat> should pick it up, or um, I'll send you a it's link a later. It's a um, specific book for you to be asking if somebody read like... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm about to frame a question. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's interesting because he outlines what he calls the BITE model of destructive influence, and it stands for behavioral information, thought, and emotional control. Okay. And um, he's a cult survivor and now helps other people get out of cults. And on so many different levels, what you're talking about are the exact techniques used yep. to indoctrinate people, um, reinforce a secondary cult identity that separates yep. itself from the authentic self, mm -hmm. and also um, maintain control over individuals. And um, I bring it up because... I think it's important to highlight um, how these destructive influences can appear in many different ways. Um, they can appear in uh, something like a pyramid scheme or they can appear in religion in general. Mm -hmm. And um, they also have very specific tactics to keep people in. And so one thing that kept you in was your children. And another technique that's often used is um, uh, a lack of sleep. And I'm curious, was that a tactic that was ever used in your life? Yep. Yeah. My whole, like, uh, sleeping schedule shifted upside down. They do these two-hour meetings late at night. Like, um, he would just do individual ones with myself and the kids sometimes, at, like, starting at midnight. Like, which was just, I would complain about that. This is insane because you can't even think straight anymore if you're trying to, like, memorize something. Um, yeah, I found, and I find just sitting for two hours straight and without being able to take notes and having to take everything to memory, that's, like, a good chunk of time. I found that odd as well with that. And... um Another thing, I mean, there's just so many different levels of how this fits perfectly into behavioral control. Um, so one of the most obvious ones and uh, when it comes to being a Muslim woman is dress. And a major feature of um, destructive influence is control over how an individual presents their clothing and hairstyles and what they're allowed to wear. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, you got married and it's like full hijab, full abaya, like yep. you're in it. And can you talk about what the role and impact of hijab was like in your life? Um, I mean, I just had to wear it all the time um, and the proper one. So I'm tall, so it was really hard for me to find large enough things in my, I used to have to, um, I guess, alter what I was wearing all the time um, and even just it was so awkward like giving birth in the hospital like I was still had to keep my hijab on meanwhile like everything else is exposed but my husband so like no like you don't have to take that off so that stays on so I found that really difficult to like just even like if I had to have surgery um, after one of my births um, he like fought with the surgeons to let me wear a hijab into the operating room they're like she has to wear a hairnet <laughs> like not so he like convinced them to wear like two or three hairnets so they couldn't see my hair like they're I'm on an operating table <laughs> they're like anyways but stuff like that it was like very so strict like it was really really strict and um it's just how it is I guess you don't just do it. I think people really underestimate the depth of control. And so when you first started wearing this as a convert, and um, I mean, you did come from, you know, a fairly conservative religious background where you did have a conservative way of dress, right? I um, do it myself, though. But oh, I do get that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but kind of in your family's background, like it's yeah, not the family um, unheard does, yeah. of. 
Right, yeah. Um, what was your experience when you first started adhering to this really strict way of dressing? Um, did you, maybe at first you, you know, valued the way that, what they tell you about the hijab and that it's protecting yourself and that it's actually a beautiful thing because that means you're special. And um, did you have that experience at first or um, did it bring up other feelings? No, it was mainly that I initially, the first time I looked at myself in the mirror, I saw like my great grandmother, like a really old, old, old order Mennonite. That's how they used to dress. And um, so I kind of just, felt like I was way back in my ancestry almost. Um, but yeah, I was really celebrated with sisters and they would take me to the hijab store and try to find stuff for me to wear and um, show me how like it's just a beautiful thing and it protects you from, you know, all the rapists running around and stuff. Like women are just so disrespected otherwise. You, I, you know, you just buy into all of it. Didn't you think, as, like, did you have any problems with rapists before the hijab? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, kind of. I had, like, a crappy past. But <laughs> right. Yeah. No, but, I, uh, but it's so stupid, like, how people think that you can't uh, <laughs> address somebody without being fully covered. Um, in... So I believe you even wore niqab for a little while. Yeah, I tried it out. He wanted uh, me to try it. Um, my co-wife wore it um, full time. So I just, I couldn't. It was so hard. I mean, you feel so way more um, segregated from society than ever. And especially because I was the most uh, active in the family. I was the most, I ran around the most and did most of the stuff. So I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. So I did it for Ramadan one time and that's it. I'm curious. So one thing about being a hijabi is that you are very clearly identifying yourself in mm -hmm. um, Western society in North America uh, in a way that um, other women who don't wear hijab or men maybe don't have to face. It's a very clear demarker of like, this is a Muslim. And yeah. um, when you were a hijabi, did you experience anti-Muslim bigotry? Um, a little bit here and there, um, just like comments, uh, at the end, I think I had like so much social anxiety by the end, I probably misinterpreted a lot of it. Um, I was like so wrapped up in, um, the whole, uh, I don't even know what was happening at the time. So Trump was elected and everyone was going crazy. So I started like seeing or thinking I was seeing more bigotry, I don't know. But I just didn't want to go out in public anymore. It was just getting too much for me. Any examples of people commenting? Um, yeah, one time I was standing in line at a grocery store and this one guy like whispered uh, to me, like, take that bag off your head. And, that, and then one time a guy on a motorcycle was uh, revving his engine and just like staring meanly at me. That was, like, as much as I experienced then. But, I what mean... Did that make... oh, go ahead. Sorry? No, no, you go ahead. go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I don't even know. <laughs> what did that make you feel like? Like, how was that? <laughs> oh, I was scared. Like, I... It's just more just, like, validates that seg segregation. Just, like, you know, they're the evil West, and we... And we always um, had in mind that we could pick up and move to the Middle East at any point. So he just made sure I would always try to be ready for that. And um, so you just feel like I'm not going to be here much longer. I don't know. Just. Hey. Um, and I think that's really interesting because that feeling of separation and also the legitimacy of the anti-Muslim bigotry that can exist in the West um, probably helped to, to fuel those persecutory delusions that were um, really indoctrinated in you by the hisms. Yep. <clears throat> Big time. 
Yeah, um, he uh, told me a few times that if we um, were in the Muslim world and went to jail for doing our work, that no matter what they're doing, torturing or putting torturing our children in front of us, that we don't name names. But he like made sure I knew that that's how important it was. So, and I, I mean, by the end, I was praying, like, you pray five times a day, and every prayer, I was just praying to be protected from persecution. That's how scared I was. So, all day long, that was going in my head, like, protect me from persecution, like, over and over, like, in my head constantly, because I was so scared now of that. It was just became, like, an insane anxiety. That's really interesting because phobia indoctrination is one of the most important ways to entrap people and to maintain control. So was there um, a specific persecution that you were um, trained to have this phobia or what other phobias did they um, indoctrinate you to have? Um, I don't know. More just like any i mean islam is designed to make you afraid of the hellfire because they describe so much of it like very detailed on purpose and Mm -hmm. like poor armin he wanted to kill himself before he came of age that story like devastated me when you said that by the way because that really proves uh how teaching children religion is child abuse like the fact that that was the conclusion that that armin came to like big time. Yeah, that's one of the most consistent part of the Quran, right? Like, uh, there's a lot of parts of the Quran in the, the Islam that people, well, we think this, we don't like. I know people are like, no, we disagree. Um, we look at it this way, but this area is like, yeah, no, we are, we all agree, and the Quran has been repeated, repeated many over and over and over again yeah. about what's waiting for people like the three of us here. The Quran is very clear oh, that we're going to be... especially us. Yes, especially that we're going to be... Because we're, we're enemies. We're the yeah. enemy. Yeah. yeah. Especially you and me. We're ex-Muslims. Yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> especially. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Um, and... Oh, shoot. I forgot what I was going to say. Wait, give me a second. Um, I think it's important to highlight what was the system of reward and punishment that was one in your um, marriage and then also in the community around you. So what would happen if you were seen to be disobeying? Wow. Um, I got uh, reprimanded a lot uh, if if we would go out in public and I spoke like to whoever it was, say if we were trying to buy something and I spoke to the salesman too, too much, um, he would reprimand me hard afterwards. Um, especially if I spoke to a Muslim man too long. Um, so there was a lot of that. I was always scared after being out in public, if there was something I did wrong that I didn't realize. Um, uh, what was the other part of the question? Um, was the system of reward and punishment mostly within your, uh, between you and your husband in your marriage, or was there also that dynamic within the larger community that you were in? Um, I mean, the larger community, usually if, uh, they don't like what you're doing, they just don't associate with you anymore basically. Like, you get cut off from different parts of the community, I find. Mm. Let me tell you something about the... Um, there's this uh, very small group of people, fringe group of people in Iran, that if you talk to the woman, after the third thing they... Like, they could... They say this... For, like, you ask them a question, the first time they ask answer normally, second time normally, third time normally. I think it's the, the third or the fourth. But the fourth time, if the woman... If you're a man talking to a woman, all of a sudden you notice they change their tone and they speak like they have to change their voice so that they sound like a man. Oh, because if you no. go past Because if you go past three times and they're talking to you in a womanly tone, then you might get... Um, Too attracted uh, or something. Attracted to their voice. 
or something. So only three times, three uh, they would, you know, they have to like. And if you if you don't know about it, you have no idea what the hell happened. Like you just they all, <laughs> <laughs> like this. it's crazy. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So it's not just for them. It's not just looking at a woman. Hearing a woman could also be yeah, too, definitely too sexually attractive. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was something I was told to do, to speak oh. on the phone. Not that, to speak uh. on the phone with a, a, a unattractive voice. Wow. Uh, if a man, okay. Yeah, if a man answered, definitely, yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious, so it sounds like the standards of behavior that you had, or that were set for you, I should say, um, towards Muslim men was way stricter than non-Muslim men, correct? Um, I guess, yeah. It's, um, yeah, right? There's the Kafirs, right? Who cares about them? It's, I mean, I still shouldn't talk to men, but I mean, it's just worse to Muslim men because they can come to your husband, talk to you about it after even, I guess. I don't know. Oh, did you ever worry about the larger community that you were in um, telling on you, reporting back to your husband about your behavior? So did you have to watch yourself around your community in case they tried to, um, yes, almost yeah. spy is a strong word, but um, yeah, report back and... Yeah, it was like that behavior. kind of... I realized that when... Um, because... My friends were the wives, like the Hizib sisters. So it was like the, all their husbands were friends with my husband. So one time, um, because I was worried because my husband kept teaching me about a polygamy. Like I said, he made me ex like accept it initially so that I knew he wanted to marry more wives. And I was telling my one friend about it. And she is uh, Pakistani and she was telling me that you know, it was meant for back then, for, like, war, when there was all these war widows, and she's giving all these explanations she grew up hearing. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So, I, of course, I run back and tell my husband. And then he went and told her husband. And then she got in trouble. And I didn't realize this. She came back to me the next day, the poor girl, and, like, had to apologize and correct herself. And that's when I realized how everything is just among everyone if we went somewhere and one of the women was barefoot like he would make me either go tell her or he would tell her husband and he had to correct his wife so there was a lot of this yeah it's really interesting to think about the ways that communities control each other right mm -hmm. and how you were mandated to not only is certain standard being enforced around y on on you, but then you have to go around and then enforce them on others, right? To properly show um, that you're part of this group. Is that fair to say? Yeah, same. Yeah. And what was your experience like when you had to correct other people on hated their behavior? Mm -hmm. It was required. I hate, mm -hmm. I, I don't like to do that kind of thing, um, enforce anything on somebody else, but um, you're just taught that you have to. And um, he was just, he was just very firm about it. So, it's called, I, What's that? It's called in Islam, you know, you have, you correcting people, telling them if they're doing something wrong. Or yeah. telling them how to do something right. Uh, it's an Islamic teaching called Amr oh, right. Ma'ruf and Nahi And you have it, to do it. You um, have no choice. Well, really? Because I thought it was encouraged to do it. Is it a mandatory? Well, that's not how I was taught it. Really? I, I have taught, to actually like, look literally, it up. We would drive past a billboard with a Muslim name, like that he's a realtor or something. And he would call him up and say, you know, you shouldn't be dealing with mortgages. You know, he was correcting just strangers on billboards, so... <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look up if it's mandatory or encouraged, but uh, Susanna, go on. Um, Armin, can you move your mic a little bit closer to your mouth? Oh, okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Is that good? Okay. Perfect. Um, and 
So were there consequences on you if you did not do these required enforcements on other people? Yeah, um, there was one, well, actually a lot of times if I hung out with other sisters that didn't wear the proper Islamic dress, um, I was always told to correct them. And he would check on me and he would ask me if I corrected them. And I hated doing that. And it, I didn't do it to my one good friend because she was pretty... She's pretty strong-headed, and I knew how she was, and she knows that with the rules. Like, why am I telling her this? And he cornered us, and he did it to her in front of me, and it was like a big scene. It was so annoying, but yeah. So it was really enforced. And um, so let's let's get into this. I, how what term do you use? Do you use sister wives, co wife? Uh, co-wife, co-wife. Okay. That's how I did it, said it. Okay. Um, so let's, yeah, start to unpack your experience of being a co-wife. Um, yep. You were the first wife. Yeah. And so how did he ingratiate you into and prepare you to have a second wife? Well, he didn't do much to prepare me. He just told me that's how it is. You know, that's and that's how he used to vet women before he would talk about marriage. He would see their reaction to that particular thing. Um, but so I, I accepted it. And for myself, I researched it as much as possible to try to figure it out and see if people are doing it. And so, I mean, I like I watched the, the show Sister Wives to see how they do it and what kind of spin that went on there. And um, read some books by other Muslims that went through it. And there's all these verses that, like, women that endure the jealousy of this get the same reward as men and jihad. So, I mean, there's, like, so much. So I was, like, looking at it as, like, I can take it as an honorable thing and try to, like, you know, maximize my heaven. I don't know. It's, because he was adamant. Like, there was really nothing I could do, either try to leave or accept it, right? Yeah, so he was bringing this up before you even got married. Yeah, well, I mean, we got married so quick, so it was like as, yeah, so and it was always a topic, like, throughout the marriage, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, how long were you married, just the two of you, before this other woman was brought in? <clears throat> Seven years. Okay, interesting. So he's, yeah, that's quite the foundation. And... What was the process of bringing that second wife in? Yeah, it was weird. It was quick. Um, he started looking on a Muslim matrimony site for a friend of ours. And then he, of course, you know, you're always open to three more, so you can always look too. And then he found someone that wanted to be a second wife. So he was like, holy, there's one. So it's, he started chatting with her, and then it happened. He, got, he married her within a week. So it was, it happened so fast. So I had very little time to process. Um, again, I just did my best. I actually went out and bought a bunch of books and joined a bunch of chat groups of women that go through this. Um, believe it or not, all the women on these chat groups are converts. They're all white converts that are part of these polygamy groups. It's so weird. Because I was like, right. I found like, we're the only ones that put up with this. <laughs> like, that's all I could figure well, it's and there's two either it's the um, the non-converts don't put up with it or is it that because the non-converts don't have they're so used to it that they don't have or they don't they, have a community to they don't need to. a community because they don't, they're like yeah this is normal we can we right. can get over. they have no one else to talk to like because for me i couldn't go to my family i, I couldn't tell them so right. i really yeah um, just mm. one thing that we mentioned before. Actually, you're right. The Amr Ben Marwan Esmond Kara is actually mandatory. I didn't know that. Oh, so see? You, so you're you're you knew more I knew than the I did. right Islam. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, oh, I'm learning from you. Okay. <laughs> Dubra is the true ex-Muslim here. I'm okay. Great. <laughs> oh my God. Um and. 
his second wife, was she also a convert or was she raised in Islam? She was a born Muslim and she also grew up in polygamy. So it was something she was used to. So um, I learned a lot from her because she... And the fact that, you know, I tried to just make the best of the situation because I had kids. And I tried to, like, just introduce it, like, smoothly for their sake. Because if they see me going through an insane breakdown and fighting it, they're going to get affected. So I tried to, like, bring it in smoothly and and be happy and do it nice. I don't know. So I want to talk a bit about the polygamy in your community. Because there's a lot of ways that people do it under the radar. And there are a lot of ways that people take advantage of the government to help um, maintain their polygamous marriages. Um, Can you describe, um, yeah, how people take advantage of um, certain government programs in Canada to help maintain their many marriages? Right. Um, So when he married a second wife, I started researching the laws carefully because I didn't know what would happen to us Um, and any prosecutions that's ever happened. And honestly, like no Muslims really get any problems, except there was one case where they found somebody had a few wives and they were all living in housing and getting social assistance as single families. Um, I didn't meet, like, I didn't experience that around my circle, but there's a lot of people just getting second and third wives, and, you know, you can't legally marry them anyways, but that just seems to be the way they get around it, that they're not legally married to them, and that's, and nobody's, you know, doing anything about it. I don't even know what you can do about it. So it just, I was scared that we would get in trouble, but then as time went on, I realized that it's happening a lot and nobody's really addressing anything or, I don't know. Technically, legally, only one of them, one of the wives are married. The other ones are pretending to be married. Not always. Like, I mean, he wasn't legally married to either of us. So he was just Islamically married to two of us. So, I mean, again, you could just be saying, I have about all these girlfriends. Mm. And having kids with them, right? Yeah. This was in Canada, right? Yeah. So in Canada, I mean, aren't you, what is it called? Like something close to marry, if you live long enough with somebody. Common law when you're common, living with them. Yeah. So he would claim common law with one of us because mm. he had to, because he had kids with us. And then he would just the other person would claim a single. So there's where the discrepancy could be because if he's providing, supposedly providing for both, she, the other one shouldn't be claiming single. But again, nobody's legally married. So what do you do? In Islam, isn't it, aren't you supposed to be treating all your wives equally? Like that's the main, so if one of you... Yeah, so we both had a house. One was claiming common law. And I guess that was the only difference. One got more social assistance than the other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, you guys were in separate houses? Yeah. Okay. We did and... live together briefly um, at one point, because I did try to leave one time and um, lost the place I was renting. And then so he made me come back, and I had to stay there for about six months before I got a new place, but, yeah. How did you, why did you leave, and how did he make you come back? Oh, yeah, things were so really bad again, and I just, I just left with my kids one day to my parents, and I didn't know what to do or say. I just, I, I just had to go, and I couldn't explain anything to my parents, and uh, so I just sat there, and they're like, stuff is wrong. I'm like, yeah, things aren't going very good, and... I couldn't explain why, and I'm still scared of, because if you dishonor your husband, that's like one of the biggest sins, so talking bad about, so that really keeps you from Wait, really you're still scared help. now? You're Sorry? Still scared. You're still scared now? No, but at the t- that time oh. I was, so okay. I couldn't even explain what the problems were, and the way he is, like, he'll just, he, he wouldn't leave me alone until he just, like, made me come back, and just, I had to, and... So, sorry, uh, do you mind telling us 
telling us why you had to leave, like why you left your parents. I, I don't tell us if you, if it's uncomfortable. What do you mean? Why I left my parents? No, your or your husband. Like at that time, the first what was time? it? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. No, it was uh, things were just like we had our vehicles taken away, and I remember like I had to like walk through blizzards to get milk for my son and it was just like I was just doing all this stuff and nobody was helping and it was I was holding up this entire huge family and I just took my kids and I called my dad and like can we come and I just it was just me trying to like I can't anymore and so that was the first time and then after that he uh tried to make me promise like that I would never do anything like that again kind of thing so it was the first time I felt that enforcement of like he made me like go back to the house and he was there and he wouldn't let me leave the house like he was like you cannot leave the house and it was that physical like just telling me and I'm just like sitting there as a woman like in Canada thinking he can't just tell me not to leave the house meanwhile I couldn't leave the house like it was just he commanded it, and I had to adhere to it. It was just, it was this weird battle in my head. I remember, like, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm in here in Canada, and he's not, not letting me leave my house. And I'm just sitting there looking out the door, and I don't want to be here, and I stayed. And it was just so crazy. Arm, do you have a question? No, I was just saying, wow. But, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. And... So, what was it like maintaining this double life? Because clearly you had, well, I mean, almost from the beginning, you know, your parents didn't know you were married or involved with this guy. All of a sudden, you're a Muslim, you're a hijabi. And then seven years later, there's this other woman involved. But like you said, you can't talk badly about your husband Mm -hmm. for fear of hellfire. And you have to maintain this second life and this second identity. Yeah. And can you talk about what it was like to maintain these two identities while also caring for all these children and trying to take care of this household? Yeah, it was really hard. I mean, I had to make stories up all the time to my parents about who this woman was that I was always with and who are these other kids and um, it it got confusing because they would catch like him out with her in public, and he knew how strict he was that he would never hang out with some other woman. So they would like question sometimes, and I just like would be adamant, like no, 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 um, because I knew also I wasn't allowed to tell, and my brothers uh, like threatened to kill him if he ever married a second wife. So he had that in his mind, too. I mean, you know, that's brotherly threats, right? Trying to protect their sister. Aren't Mennonites, like, passive? like this? Uh, oh, yeah, but I mean, they... <laughs> they must have got to, like, if you can get Mennonites... So get... this to them means don't go in the war. But oh. they can still fight and do all, like... They said they're going to kill him. Well, I <laughs> You no, know, but that means that that means that they they cared about you so much. If you could get yeah. about it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know. I mean, they didn't even know. Like even after I left the second time, and I was in a women's shelter, I still hadn't told them. And it took. Um, my mom called me at the shelter, saying that he had called her and convinced her to have us all sit down together and try to resolve things. And I was already in a shelter with my kids. And I then I was just like, holy. And then I called my other friend. And she goes, you have to tell her. And then she goes, I'll tell her. So my friend told her for me. Because I just, I still couldn't. Because how do you even now I have to explain five years of lies that I've been holding. And, And I couldn't even, didn't even know where to start. And so then my family was fired up. And it was that was it after that but I was so glad my friend helped me break that out because that was very hard to get out to them what did they tell you when they met you sorry what did they tell you next when they met you and when your parents met you after yeah 
Well, my mom, she came and picked me up uh, to take me to see a lawyer, and uh, she was just so mad because now everything was coming back to her. She's like, so that time was that, and that. she was like, and but they weren't upset with me, which was, of course, I felt so guilty that they would just hate me for it, but no, they just, like, it was all towards him, <laughs> of course, they're my family, right? So, yeah. Before they found out um, through this friend of yours, did you feel ashamed to tell other people? Um, yeah, some people. Um, I mean, to other Muslims, we were like this example, right? So he used to bring people over. You should have seen. It was so crazy. He used to bring these couples over these men that wanted a wife that would be as nice as me and they would plop the wife in front of me and she's just like scared like what the hell this is happening and so I'm supposed to coach her on how to accept a second wife into the family so I was like this person to go to and uh, I mean I didn't but this is the only advice I could give them <laughs> was uh, I would get mad at, like, the process of what their husband's doing to them. And then I would just tell them, like, you have to just look at it like, uh, now you have all this free time, <laughs> you're only going to see him half as much. So, like, live yourself, find your own self, and take advantage of that. And that's all I could tell them. I couldn't sit there and tell them that they're being honorable and letting this guy, oh, it just made me sick. Even then it made you sick? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, because the way they went about it, I didn't like the way they were going about it. For me, I was like, because they didn't like it. Like, if I had been fighting it and, like, he was forcing it on me, that's a different. But for me, I, like, he got me to accept it and I was, like, accepting it. So, it was like, you can't, like, force her when she doesn't want it. And they were trying to make her want it. So, I just tried to, like, present some positive aspects that I use, I guess. I love that the one positive aspect is like you don't have to see this asshole on yes, like half the time. Exactly, especially because I would get so mad at the process of this jerk who's like bringing her here, <laughs> making her do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really hard. And how did you see women treated in your community? Yeah, um, I had friends that would get grounded by their husband all the time, like, for disobeying or whatever. Um, it's just how it was. Like, you just follow the rules, you know. Uh, we were just have to be thankful that our husband's so nice to us, you know, that kind of thing. And then, again, you're so busy with your kids, especially, like, all of us. Like, all of us just always pregnant and having kids. And, like, you can't, to try to do anything, especially, like, the daily rituals of Islam on top of that. Like, you have kids running around and you're not allowed to stop your prayer no matter what's happening. That is traumatizing, I find. Like, your kid's screaming, crying, but, like, now you got to put Allah first. Otherwise, like, mm. you know, shame on you if you put your kid first, you know. So I found that really hard, like, to put my kids second always I think the ways that religion will take away those most innate human behaviors of how we're supposed to love each other and treat oh. our own family is one of the most damaging aspects in the world it will it it takes away your humanity it's yeah. absolutely <clears throat> I don't even have words yeah. I had a friend who, she was all alone. She was a convert. She uh, married a really nice guy. And they tried to uh, have a baby for a long time, like 10 years. And she finally had a baby. And I went to her house. And there was you know, those other religious sisters there. And they told her, I, it was the hardest thing. They told her, they said, you cannot love this baby more than the prophet. Like, they just told her that. And she was just like, can you imagine, like, after 10 years of trying, you finally have a baby, and that's what you're told? Like, But that's how you dehumanize. That's how you can, like, honor kill your kids at the end of the day, right? If you're just putting the religion first. 
In, during the Iran and Iraq war, there's um, countless of examples, and there's videos of these of um, moms um, wanting to offer their kids to go to war, hoping that their kids will die yeah. in war. Yeah. Hoping like the, their greatest dream is for kids like. And cel- if they do die, celebrating that their kids died in war, becoming a martyr. It's the best way to die, right? Yeah. The best way. Like, my husband used to uh, pray. He told me that he prayed every day that we all died as martyrs. And so that scared me. That's why my counter prayer all day was to protect me from persecution. That was just terrifying to me. But he thought that was the greatest thing. Well, obviously, most Muslims say that's the greatest way to die right yeah but it's one thing for you to want to be murdered but for like for watching videos of moms crying to please take my son like take my son please this is the thing forcing kids into it that's insane right like but and it's also seen as a sign of how loyal how loyal you are to your ideas that something like you, you know you're showing that like something so dear to me i'm willing to sacrifice something so dear to me in the name of this ideology, and that yeah. shows how loyal I am to this religion and this ideology. Oh my gosh, that's devastating. So, things obviously started to change when the second woman came into the marriage. Yeah. And so, how did things start to fall apart? Um. It was mainly, I guess, uh, a breakdown of, um, I just couldn't anymore. Like, it's just, I had so much happening, and um, I had, I have an autistic son, so he, he was in daily therapy at the time, even. And um, I, um, I was carrying both families, basically. I, I felt I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, and I just didn't know what to change, though. So I presented that to them, and I said, something has to change. And I told him as well, I know that things aren't going to change, so, like, I don't know what to do. Like, I wanted a divorce, but I couldn't say it. And I couldn't even imagine what leaving would look like. And I tried to get some space for a while, and then when I saw his persistence, when he wouldn't let me have space, and that he was scared I might start thinking elsewhere that's when I realized like how the manipulative control was there like I really started to see it more when he was panicking that I was wanting to kind of get out somehow and uh, things escalated through that like me trying to leave and um, that's how I like ended up having to go to a shelter and he was trying to remove me from the kids and take the kids and that kind of thing this is one reason, one important reason why for um, for a lot of them to have kids very fast because um, they can control you through the kids. They like, they know especially that the that the kids are very important to the mothers, and mm-hmm. no, you know, and you know, no matter no matter how much independence you want, if they can control the kids, they could they could control the woman if they could have yeah. any yeah. Yeah, well, and what really made me want to go also is um, I just, I couldn't imagine, like, my daughter getting in the same kind of marriage. I was just like, that was it. There was no, like, if I just stayed, that was, they're really, like, almost doomed to that same life. So that was another reason I, uh, I something had to change. I didn't know what. It kind of ended up this way, but I, I had to get out somehow. Like, you can't even see what out is, but you just know that you just got to get out. Like, I had a bag packed for months in my car just because I felt like I had to escape all the time. I didn't even know where or how or why. Mm. It's really interesting how children can be used, yeah, to tighten that control. And it also serves to keep you in um, a form of environmental control as well. Because you have to stay near your kids, you need to take care of them, and you need to provide shelter for them, all these things. But um, it sounded like they were 
planning to tighten the environmental control on a different level. There were plans to leave Canada at one point, yeah. right? There was always plans for us all to move. So now it was kind of escalating. Uh, him and uh, the other wife went to a number of countries and, to look, I guess, to see what what would work kind of thing. And I was left with all the kids. And so, again, that just made it harder on me. And I guess easier to leave, too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I avoided going and getting passports made for my kids on purpose for at least a couple of years because he kept pushing me to go get passports go get passports and that obviously is the last step because then you can just leave once you have all that so I would always stall and like make excuses and um the fact that this trip was happening now uh, I just couldn't imagine going just, and it wouldn't just be a nice country. Like when you're trying to reestablish the Hilafa, you're not going to go to Dubai or like Mecca. <laughs> like you're going to go to like a pretty war stricken area where you can control something. Right. So we were looking at like, you know, other corners of Lebanon and, and like the bordering Syria, like those places. And uh, it's just how do you raise uh, an autistic child with, like, dietary restrictions. And, like, he didn't care because, like, we were looking in, he was looking into, like, giving him, like, uh, camel's milk to cure. Like, honestly, like, going into, like, this old, old school stuff, like, it scared me. <laughs> like, wow. I'm like, I'm going to kill my kids. I'm just literally. And then he would say, that's, a, that's the best place to die, like, is there. So we would rather die over there than here. So, And if our time of death is already pre-planned, it doesn't matter where we're living. So again, there's that, right? So you can't, yeah. Was this, this is what really pushed you to, like, try, um, because you were trying to leave for a while but was this the, yeah. the final push that you needed this was yeah this was definitely it was like a escalation i i was breaking down a lot like just as a woman um i just i couldn't handle this life anymore my body was breaking down there was like a point where i just felt like i died like just sitting there like my my soul just like i almost felt a crack that was like, I tell people that's the day Munira died. Like, she was gone that day. And the title of the book I'm writing is Munira Died a Martyr. Because that woman just did everything she could. And that's it. So, that's pretty much the end of my ropes at that point. And I just, I at that point, I just was looking for a way out. And I didn't know what it was. But it, it was just that. When is your book coming out? Well, I'm writing it right now, so I'm just working on it. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Let's go to how what happened, like when you, uh, Susanna, to how you left and what, how, how was that like? Yeah, exactly. Um, what was yeah, that? That was, um, let me think. So what happened was, uh, this was me, after they came back from their trip, um, I wanted to change things and I didn't want him to come to my house anymore and give me space and I needed I didn't want the kids to lose access so I said like just leave me alone let the kids go back and forth so they're fine I didn't they're the number one thing I wanted things to stay normal for them and I needed to figure something out for myself and uh, he just didn't allow it he cornered me he would like ask me what I'm doing wrong because I'm being punished for things. And, I mean, I, I twisted my ankle and I couldn't walk for a day. And he stood there and said, like, you need to think about what you did to deserve this. Like, so everything's a punishment, you know. So he um, got to a point where he was, told me I wasn't allowed to leave the house anymore. And from now on, like, that was it. And he was being too lenient up until that point. And um, so then I just made an excuse to take the kids to my parents for the weekend. And uh, then I told them that I want to leave. I did tell them. I didn't tell them about the second wife at that point, but I said I do want to leave. And they were going to try to help me. And um, he, I don't know, he, he took my one son from therapy 
the one day and then he threatened to get the rest of the kids with people and that's when I went to the shelter and then some more things happened and I ended up getting a restraining order from that and um, so that with a restraining order is the best thing honestly because then he couldn't talk to me anymore that was like I've had silence for three years now it's been the most beautiful thing to be able to think for myself again that was what I needed but uh, yeah and so I think you're obviously incredibly brave and incredibly strong for fighting for yourself and fighting for your children but you were in such a tightly controlled environment and ideology and under basically thought control and thought reform Mm -hmm. was it difficult to help ask for help from the people you had been taught to have a deep disdain for um yeah I, I didn't even know how to like I didn't know how to ask or what to ask um I had a friend with me who was a social worker so she could help me ask for what I needed <clears throat> even in the shelter I had people come to me a bunch of times and say that look like, you can make a decision like it didn't even dawn on me that I have not made a decision for myself for like 12 years so that's what Islam really does. You don't know how to make any decision for yourself because everything's dictated you. So that's still something I'm learning. It's like I'm in control of everything myself. I don't have to worry about it. It's, it's just like a, it's really, uh, I guess that's brainwashing like at its, you know, core. <clears throat> that's what's so important. Why I think it's so important to educate people about destructive influence because um, where it arises it sets out to um, destroy independence and build um, uh, dependency and a lack of self strong enough to break from these systems of control and um, so what was it like to after 12 years of these forms of control over your life, shutting down your authentic identity, dictating every second of your life, dictating what you are allowed to think and being taught to fear doubt, have a phobia of doubt, all built around suppressing your authentic identity and building up this second Islamic cultic identity what's the process been like of remembering who Deborah is yeah that was that was so hard and it was weird because I felt like I reverted right back to the Debbie that was the 27 year old that met my ex I I started acting the same I listened to to the exact same music again it was like I just went back in time and I lost 12 years and it was like it was so strange it was like I just lost a huge chunk of time and I was trying to navigate with my kids at the same time so it's been a journey the past three years definitely and um I didn't want I didn't even consider leaving Islam Also, again, the whole, you're set in it, especially the apostasy thing, it's like you set that in your mind, that that's it. And, um, yeah, it was, um, my ex wrote in court papers that I had publicly denounced Islam when I hadn't. And that's like a crazy accusation for a Muslim to call, right? Like, that's like a scare, almost like a, like, why are you, that confused me and kind of pushed me to be like, yeah, actually... (laughs) I think that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> so, wow. um, it, it made me like really look at everything. And I started really seeing like all of the cult aspects. My lawyer even was the first one to point out the cult aspect to me. Um, oh, yeah. I had never even considered that. I think it's really interesting that he 
put forward this accusation against you. And then that kind of gave you the room to start to question for yourself. Yeah. Like, is this something yeah. I really want to maintain on in my oh, Armin? No, no, go ahead. No, no, I'm just saying after I want to. Oh, OK. Yeah. So how how did this um, false accusation of your own apostasy um, help you start to build up maybe a mental space to consider actually going forward with leaving Islam? Yeah. Um, good question. I um, I think you just start to see things a bit more objectively. Um, it's just, I mean, it's just so one-sided. Like, it's so obviously a religion made by man for men. <laughs> like, just, come on. But um, I started um, watching some atheist talks on Facebook on YouTube, and it was the first one, the first thing was, um, I forget who it was, Ricky Gervais was saying that uh, teaching children about hell is child abuse, and that had never dawned on me before, and that's when I started, like, exploring just that aspect of religion, because honestly, I remember being tortured as a child, just terrified of stupid, like, nonsense, but you're so scared, like it's a real thing. Like Armin wanted to kill himself, it was that bad. I would be shaking in bed for hours thinking that the devil was beside me. Like, all the time. <laughs> it's just, that's so abusive to kids. And that just sets you off for the rest of your life like that. Armin, now's your time. No, I just want to say, like, did you ever, like... Do you, was there a time that you meant that you thought to yourself, "I'm not a Muslim anymore"? Like, was there? Do you remember that? Like, I read it. Yeah, no. No. yeah. It was shortly after that. That's when I started exploring. Uh, I was like, "Yeah, I actually do," <laughs> because everyone had asked me up until that point, and I had avoided it. Right. I couldn't even consider it. But I'm like, you know what? Like, it just you know proves like how ridiculous it is. The fact that me leaving the religion should be a fearful thing and so that just made me more angry about it it's like this is just like i can't even leave it like you can't even believe different it's just so how come you looked into atheist um you know atheism on youtube like how come because you you didn't look into other religions or maybe no. something else? Yeah, no. I um I started dating somebody and he sent me that video. He was saw the deprogramming needed in me. Like we watched like um uh post 9/11 war movies and stuff. I couldn't do that stuff. I couldn't I would have a panic attack cuz I would like be sympathizing with the wrong side of things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly, I was like watching one. I couldn't even watch it. I was like this is wrong like I'm looking at the American troops as all the enemy. I can't watch this movie, <laughs> like, properly. Wow. So it took a long time to get out of that. So he really helped me to, like, just process and, like, look at, you know, <laughs> the right way of history. And I rewatched, like, all these, like, old war documentaries just to, like, get my, my brain back on track. How long did it take? Like, it seemed like the brainwashing was so deep. Yeah, like, it's been three years now, and I'm still, still working on it. Like what? Like, like what is it? What is it? What is after all this? After three years, what is still a struggle? Oh, just unraveling things. Just um, like for instance, hang on, I have a point here about um, just how you feel. Oh yeah, how you think that everything that comes to you is like fate or God's will or like you just don't like you do have control of things but way more than what religion lets you know you know so I those remember, things are just yeah I remember after leaving Islam uh, you know even you know after leaving Iran and Islam for a very long time the flag of Israel still made my you know screen crawl like i've like yeah. every, every time i saw a flag of israel even after like many years after i felt like i'm looking into the eyes of the devil just seeing a flag of israel that 
that the Palestine conflict is the hard. That's the newest thing. I actually watched um, Apostate Prophet's explanation of the conflict. That was the best thing I ever saw because that's not the history I was like aware of. Like not in that way. Um, I would have like screaming matches with my boyfriend about the Palestine conflict because I still was just adamant that you know about. I- I do want to caution, though, not to go too far, uh, like, because one thing I noticed with some ex-Muslims is that because they've been, they realize that they've been lied to about so many things, they sent, they then start believing almost everything that is in contradiction to what they were used to. Being oh, yeah. Told. No, I, yeah. I know what you're saying. Definitely. Yeah. So, like, now I know ex-Muslims that think, like, oh, Israel cannot do any wrong and there is no human oh, rights well, violation. No, that's... Yeah. <laughs> and the whole Zionist agenda comes into play, right? Right, right. No, yeah. But um, oh, I hear some echo, but that's fine. Do you, do you, are you able to eat pork right now? Because that's something other people have a struggle yeah. with. Oh my gosh. I remember that when I was staying in the shelter, a woman started cooking bacon and I literally ran and almost threw up from the smell of it because I had not smelled bacon being cooked really? it was so hard but honestly after a while I started just eating it every day just like make it, <laughs> it just felt so good I just go through it's like put bacon on that like just <laughs> <laughs> so, hell yeah oh my yeah. gosh I have a question so at what point did you decide to take off the hijab I took it off um, as I was trying to leave him. Um, not all the time. Just when I was out running around with kids, I was like, that's enough. I had enough wearing it. I uh, I had, um, I remember I put a meme up on Facebook. It was that one where that woman's holding a book and it said like, what men have to say about hijab and then there's nothing in the book. I started seeing it that way. I'm like, men don't know what it's like. And I can't function in this anymore. So, and he had caught me and found out that I had taken it off. And he took all the kids and like interrogated them all to find out how long this was going on. And um, so I, I did take it off earlier. Okay, two questions. How one? How did it feel like taking off the hijab? What did? What was it? Oh, felt like I was part of human race again. <laughs> I was like, I blended in again. It was so nice. People talk to me. It's just like, holy, like, frick. I didn't feel scared or anything that someone's going to attack me, but I felt like just part of society again. It was wonderful. And um, second question, what did the hijab, you know, represent in your, like, back then to you? And what does it, does it represent to you now? So back then it was like, uh, I guess initially it's, modesty and like protecting yourself um it became just like an extreme hardship (laughs) instead and then um yeah so now i see it as like a real way to control people like it's like what yasmin muhammad says like it's like a physical shackle Mm. like it's a physical control on top of all the other control um, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of people don't understand, uh, and you could correct me if I'm uh, wrong about this, but to me it seems like a lot of people don't understand that it's not just about an extra piece of clothing that you have to wear. Um, it's more about being told what you have to be, what you what you have to wear, and being put in your place by you having to listen to that. Um, yeah. And and all the all of all of the meaning that comes with the, uh, being a, for other people to being uh, to be able to force you to wear to wear like it comes with a lot of other um, it has a lot of other meanings associated with that right um, yeah. and the, the example I give to people and I mentioned this to Yasmin as well and she she liked it when she came back to secular artist as a guest I mentioned like imagine. Because I know a lot of people like, oh, it's not, it's just a piece of cloth. Like, who cares? Like, I could put a hat on. Like, yeah. I don't feel that kind of. And I said, the example I give to people to understand why this is such a big deal is like, imagine if I'm, um, me, you, and my wife are speaking with each other, um, and then my wife, let's say, interrupts me, right? And I go to my wife and say, like, why did you interrupt me? You had no right to do that. 
go sit in the corner, right, for 15 minutes, sit in the corner and think about what you just did, right? And then she listens to me and she goes sits in the corner. And then you look at me and like, what the hell just happened? How could you do that to your wife? And I, if I, if my response is like, well, sitting is not a bad thing. Like sitting yeah. is, is that like I'm actually feeling tired right now. I could sit right now a little bit. Yeah. Like, do you, why do you think that's a significant thing that to do to a woman? Sitting, right? But yeah. you understand that when you when you see that I could tell my wife to go sit there and she listens to me, you could tell what the nature of re- our relationship is like. And yeah. where she sees herself in this relationship. Yeah. And where I see myself in this relationship. Exactly. So it's not just about the act of sitting. It's about being commanded to do something and them having to listen to it, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So. Yeah, right. yeah I was thinking of an uh, analogy the other day about um, how, you know, as Muslims, you're torturing yourself, basically, by uh, practicing the religion. But you're just telling yourself that it's good for you because God said it's good for you. It doesn't matter. Like, it's imagine, like, you're sitting there punching yourself over and over and you're, like, getting bruised and bloody and people are telling you to stop it. You're like, no, 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 like, this is good for me. I was told it's good for me. And there's nothing you can do to make that person stop until they almost die from it, right? Well, sister, what you don't understand that this life is temporary and yeah, we have to think see? about... Yeah. We're here for a traveler and then we have eternity, you know, on these rivers of wine and stuff. Yeah, you guys don't understand. You're focusing on the this yeah. life, which is, is such a small, like, we, we have eternity to look forward to. Exactly. And you guys are like, oh, this is bad for our children. This is bad. Oh, you're back. Oh, poor yeah. you, blood. Like, you understand... Do you, do you understand what hellfire is going to feel on your back? Exactly. It's nothing. <laughs> nothing compared to hellfire. Yeah. So, like you said, you first took off the hijab when you were kind of in this process of leaving him, right? Yeah. So, I think it's important to highlight that this is when you began to make decisions for yourself again. Yeah. You were making the decision to leave and you made the decision of what goes on your body. Yeah. Now, what was the significance of that like at the time? Yeah, I don't even, re- like, I just remember being really scared that somebody would see me that knew me. Um, also, I didn't care and I kind of wanted to get caught because I kind of wanted him to just get mad enough to just divorce me on the spot at the same time. But, and again, like, I, I I had no idea how he would react with all this stuff because I've never seen him in this situation, so I couldn't predict anything. But um, I don't know. I felt good, and I just knew I didn't want to stay in that marriage. So I felt good not, like, having that decision, I guess. And what was it like to... Did you did you feel um, the the programming towards the hijab? Did you feel like you were exposing yourself? Did you feel like you were naked and this was shameful? Or when you made that decision, had you kind of let that go? Um, no. I what happened was, um, I think it was the day around that day that, that I like broke. And I, um, I remember I had a pair of glasses that had a crack in it for like a year. So I'm like walking around these broken glasses for like a year. And uh, I had lost a pile of weight from stress and like no clothes fit or anything. So I just got up and I went to, I bu- booked a hair appointment and I made them do my hair. And then I went to a glasses place and got a pair of like uh, trial contacts and threw my glasses in the garbage. And then I went to my friend's house, and I'm like, that's it. <laughs> I'm done. And they were like, woo. So I felt good. I actually felt good. I felt pretty, finally. Um, so I was, I was started feeling good. Did, w- did your family, um, were your family happy? Did they think you're going to co- go come back to Christianity? <laughs> or oh, of had- course. Oh, oh, they still think, yeah, they still want, yeah. Yeah, so, you know. They always want that. So, so how is your how is life now as an atheist? Oh my gosh, man! Like you can enjoy life so much more. It's just 
great. And I'm trying to like impart that on my kids to show them how, how great life is. Honestly, just like going out in the sunlight and just like feeling the wind. <laughs> like it's just so nice. It's just you so should, many uh, things. I don't know if you heard about the book from Masia Linaja, The Wind in My Hair. Um, oh, no. Yeah, the, she describes taking the hij- her hijab for the first time, taking it off in that book. It's, oh, you, my God. You might actually really enjoy that book. Uh, I like, bet. Yeah, yeah. Check it out if you have time. Yeah, I will. I think that's awesome. It's so... It makes me so happy to hear you describe how you're taking care of yourself now and you're attending to... Who was Deborah? Who was you authentically and truly? Like, I literally just got shivers. Um, because I can see that smile in your face and the work that you're doing to lift that weight off your shoulders, I think, is so impactful. And I'm really looking forward to everything you're doing to help tell people oh, about thanks. your story, tell people about the reality of these tightly controlling cult groups is like i mean you're truly a survivor of cult abuse it's a hundred percent a cult people need to be aware of this just because like how many million people adhere to this it's still a cult it's exactly a cult exactly what do you mean that by like because of the methods that they use the brainwashing, it's, the clothes It's violence. just the daily ritual aspect of it and your view of this life being so short. It just makes you um, make wrong decisions and hurt yourself and other people. And ultimately, I, I just, I can't see it like being a good thing when you're adhering to something so strictly ever. I did. Again. How do you compare your experience with the Mennonites compared to Hezbollah Tahrir? And again, just to be clear to people, this is not a good comparison of Christianity with Islam experience. This is specifically, <coughs> no. this is specifically the Mennonite experience of Christianity and the Hezbollah Tahrir experience of Islam. But how would you compare them? <coughs> um, I don't. They don't have as many daily rituals. Um. But yeah, it's very, very much like focusing more on the afterlife all the time, um, focusing on hell, and even like never being sure where you're going, like that type of thing. So Mennonites are are like that. And um, again, the view of women was better to me in Islam because uh, women were being rewarded for all of uh, the hardships instead of being it being a punishment, according to my Mennonite upbringing. Wow. So, so it's just, that was a said, difference. So, okay, so the, the things that you said previously, those are the similarities, right? Mm-hmm. So wait, so the, the, the difference is that Islam was better on women than the Mennonites? <laughs> yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> You, I'll tell, I'm going to write some stories about these Mennonite women's lives. I'm telling you, it's like horrific. Wow. In your, yeah. in the book, right? In the book that is coming out. Well, that might need a whole separate book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you had, you have, uh, b- both your experience with Islam and Christianity were extremely unique. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I wonder, okay, that's amazing. Um, what? Uh, Susanna, I don't know when you're going to ask us, but like, let's also ask when, where can people follow her and find her content? Or, oh, uh, right, yeah. So I'm just on Twitter right now um, okay. as like an ex-Muslim type of thing doing stuff so far, yeah. Okay, what's um, it? Her Twitter is Debra. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, ten seventeen. So that's D-E-B-R-U-H 1017. Uh, I'm also going to provide links in the description. Um, but there's some more things I want to talk about before we close. So, um, you know, now you've exited, you're starting to find your authentic self again. Um, I think it's really interesting how you mentioned that you felt like you returned to, like your authentic self was literally on pause. Yeah. And when you left, it's like you age regressed. 
that is a yeah. classic experience of cult survivors. It happens oh, really? again and again and again. Yeah, you're not alone. That oh, it happens gosh. commonly to people. They'll start dressing the same way they used to yep. at that age, I listening was to the same exactly. music. I had no other identity. There was nothing else. It was so, and I watched myself doing it and like remarked on it all the time. I'm like, this is my only identity I know. And this was like 12 years ago. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just so weird. Yeah. So you're certainly not alone in that. And this is why it's important to talk to people about these things, because then you start to realize the similarities in different forms of destructive influence and how you're not crazy and you're not unusual for the way that your psyche is responding to to the different systems of control that were put over you. And so obviously you had a very specific um, experience as a convert. Yeah. Um, And what has your experience been like as you enter the ex-Muslim community? (laughs) Um. Yeah, nobody I know personally. Actually, I have one friend who's an ex-Muslim, but she doesn't live near me. But it's just you guys online is my only experience so far. It's just all new so far. It's great. You guys are, like, so bold. Like, when I was watching some of the videos that uh, Apostate Prophet are doing, even his name rubbed me the wrong way initially, like, as, like, holy, like, Muslims would be so mad at that. Just his name. So, no, it's great, and you guys, like, are doing great work, and it's helped me a lot. Like, again, like, just hearing what you guys talk about, and it's just, uh, again, reprocessing everything. It's great. You're doing great work. I can't imagine how much your story, like, I'm really glad that you're putting your story out there, because I I can't (laughs) imagine how many people like need that like as and and will be inspired by you like your story will is a source of inspiration for i think a lot of people that need exactly that oh, i hope so i don't know <clears throat> no i i'm, Initially, I'm it was sure for my but... kids to have that uh i guess example i have to be the opposite example <laughs> of their dad so it's no, really well, important well, I'm really glad that you decided to share it, so thank you for all that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I can tell that you are just ready to shout from the rooftops, right? And that's awesome. We definitely want to support you in that, so you have an open invitation to come back anytime, Um, whether or not your book is done or whatever. Um, (laughs) I'm, I'm ready for this uh, book about your experience with Islam and the Hesbies. I love when you said Hesbies. Um, (laughs) That made me laugh. Um, And also, you know, you also, I need this secondary book about the Mennonites. Like, so fascinating. Um, Yeah, I feel like I could just talk to you for ages, but thank you for joining us, Deborah. It's been an absolute pleasure. If no, you ever great. decide to, if you ever decide to start a YouTube channel as well, um, let us know. We we would like to promote that as well. If you ever decide. Oh, to do that. Yeah, sure. I don't know what it would be though. So far, but yeah. Thanks though. <laughs> yeah, and also yeah, and also, yeah, like Susanna said, especially you, it's open invitation, but also especially when your book is when your book is out, we would like to come yeah. and uh, yeah talk about the book as well. Oh, for sure, definitely. Yeah, let us know. We will help promote you, girl. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this I'm going to stop recording, Susanna. Is that right? Okay, great. Wow, Susanna, by the way, Susanna is really, you're, you're a great, you're a better host than I, I, I could ever be. So it's great that you're, so thank you you're again. Good. Thank you. Great yes. interviewer. That was yeah, really good interview. questions. Oh, like, holy. Yeah. <clears throat> But like every time she asks a question, like I would never ask that question. That's a great question. Yeah, you right. made me think about <laughs> stuff I hadn't thought about before. That was good. All right, all right. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>